Hello chemists, this is Ms. Pulcino and you are watching lesson 11.5 on equilibrium expressions. In today's lesson we are going to quantitatively determine, or in other words just calculate, if the forward or the reverse reaction is favored at equilibrium. Hopefully by now you know that at equilibrium in a reversible system the rate of the forward and the rate of the reverse reaction are equal. Uh, that does not mean that we'll have equal concentrations of products and reactants. Uh, we could have a bunch of reactants still left over that didn't react, and we'd say the reverse reaction was favored, or we might have a large quantity of products, and we'd say that the forward reaction was favored. Uh, so today we're just going to be doing some calculations to figure that out. Uh, it's definitely going to be a little mathy today, so if you don't have one already, go grab a calculator before moving on in this lesson. Okay, uh, so to establish equilibrium, first and foremost, we need a reversible process. In this case, we have A and a reversible reaction with B. We know that this arrow does not mean at equilibrium. We have to um, make sure some criteria are met in order for us to establish it. First, we need to make sure the system is closed. Uh, we want to keep the temperature and pressure constant. If these two requirements aren't met, um, if you go back to lesson 11.4, we know we're going to have changing concentrations, changing temperature and pressure. We're going to stress the system and the equilibrium point is going to move around. Finally, we just need to give the system some time to reach equilibrium. And if you change any of the conditions, equilibrium has been disrupted. Uh, so really, if you're trying to establish equilibrium in a reversible system, close it off and leave it alone. What we're going to be calculating today is called the equilibrium constant, or KEQ. And quite simply, it's just taking the concentration of the products and dividing by the concentration of the reactants. Um, both the concentrations should be expressed in terms of molarity, or capital M. From a mathematical perspective, there are really only three possible options. We could have a KEQ value that is greater than 1, that is equal to 1, or that is less than 1. KEQ will always be positive. We can't have a negative concentration of reactants or products. So take a second and see if you can figure that out. What is that telling us if the value of KEQ is less than 1, greater than 1, or equal to 1? All right, at equilibrium, if KEQ is less than 1, <clears throat> excuse me, it means we have more reactants than products at equilibrium, and the reverse reaction was favored. We have a larger denominator than we do num numerator, and that's, of course, going to give us a value less than 1. If 1, sorry, if KEQ is greater than 1, now the forward reaction has been favored. We have a greater quantity of products than we do reactants. And from time to time, you run, might run into a case where KEQ is equal to 1, and we have equal quantities of product and reactants. Um, so in that case, neither reaction was favored. That's really it for the first part of the lesson. We're going to calculate some KEQ values and then use that information, basically compare KEQ to 1, to figure out which reaction, if either, were favored at equilibrium. So let's try out a simple example. We've got a system at equilibrium, and if I haven't stated it already, it's definitely worth mentioning, KEQ is for systems that we know are at equilibrium. Let's say that at equilibrium the concentration of A is 0.2 molar and the concentration of B is 0.02 molar. What is KEQ? So we know that KEQ is equal to the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the reactants. And you might be thinking, well, how am I supposed to know which to put in the numerator and the denominator? Technically, since the forward and the reverse reaction are taking place, aren't they both reactants and both products? You make a good point. The convention is to treat the left side of the equation as reactants and the right side of the equation as products, just the same way you would if it was a one direction reaction. Go ahead and plug in your values for KEQ. And those square brackets mean molar, so I tend to leave out my units, save myself a little bit of time in writing. And you probably don't have to pull out a calculator to know that the answer is going to be less than 1. In this case, KEQ is equal to 0.1, and since KEQ is smaller than 1, we know that the reverse reaction was favored. Hopefully pretty simple. 
let's look at a situation that's a little bit more realistic. We are probably not going to be studying such simplistic systems. We're used to seeing multiple reactants and multiple products along with coefficients. The same general idea, concentration of products over concentration of reactants, applies, but now our KEQ formula is a little bit more complicated. We're going to take our products, in this case P and Q. We'll still keep them in the numerator, but our coefficients, I'm not making a mess, are going to become exponents. So we'll take the coefficients and we'll turn them into powers or exponents. We're going to do the same thing for the reactants. I've got the concentration of the reactants in the denominator. And I'm going to take the coefficients and turn them into exponents. So again, still products divided by reactants, except this time coefficients become exponents. In our KEQ expressions, we really only include gases. Uh, gases go through pretty substantial changes in concentration, whereas solids and liquids will not. So we ignore solids and liquids. For example, if Q was a liquid instead of a gas, we would just omit that entire term. The only other species we'll do this for, um, uh, KEQ will be for uh, gases. There are times where you'll write what's called a KSP, and that's for aqueous solutions. Uh, we'll get into that at a later point in time. Let's go ahead and try a practice problem. Um, in this case, we've got nitrogen and hydrogen reacting to form ammonia, and we've got equilibrium concentrations of the three substances. We're going to write a general KEQ expression. We're going to solve for the value of KEQ, and then based on that value, we'll determine whether the forward or reverse reaction was favored at equilibrium. So I'm going to pull that up in my practice problems, make it a little bit easier to work with. I'll meet you there in a minute. Okay, so here we are in the practice problems. We're looking at the same equation. So when we ask for the KEQ expression, you know that KEQ is equal to the concentration of the products, and in this case, NH3, ammonia. We're going to take that coefficient of 2 and turn it into an exponent. We're going to divide by the concentration of the reactants. Again, make sure that your coefficient becomes an exponent. Um, I guess before you start writing, you should probably double check and make sure that you are working with all gases, and in this case we are. And that's it for the KEQ expression. To solve for KEQ, we want to plug in. In these situations, I'll give you equilibrium concentrations. Concentration of ammonia is 0 to 0. We'll raise that to the second power. Nitrogen is 0 0.40 molar. And hydrogen is 0 0.010 molar to the third power. Take a second, grind through the calculation. The math itself is not difficult, but it is really easy to make some careless mistakes um, with all of the exponents. You should calculate a KEQ equal to 1,000. We know to take the KEQ and compare it to 1. 1,000 is much greater than 1. Um, so that means our numerator is bigger than our denominator. Our products are at a great, greater concentration than our reactants. So the forward reaction must have been favored at equilibrium. And that's it. Uh, try out questions two and three. Make sure you can do it. And be careful. Don't turn it on autopilot. Pay attention to phases. Don't let me catch you. All right, let's get back to the notes. So the problem that we just tackled is a pretty straightforward application of calculating KEQ. I've gone through, I've given you the equilibrium concentrations. You just got to put them in the right spots, hit the buttons on the calculator in the right order, and you can calculate KEQ. Um, let's make it a little bit more interesting. We're going to use a tool called an icebox. And the icebox is just going to help us um, kind of organize our thoughts and our work so that we can determine equilibrium concentrations of different substances. If you check the bottom of the, um, the page that you're on in your workbook, you're going to see the reaction between hydrogen, H2, iodine, I2, and it's going to produce HI, hydrogen iodide, and those are all in the gas phase. So we're going to use this tool, this ice box, and you sometimes might hear it called a rice chart or a rice table um, to organize our work and ultimately figure out the equilibrium concentration. And the first step is in that top row, just write a balanced chemical equation, putting each substance in its own box. 
might be wondering, well, where does that name ice come from? Well, we're going to write initial, change, and equilibrium in the leftmost column. Um, sometimes you'll see somebody, or maybe in a textbook, write reaction. I usually don't, but totally okay. And that's where you might hear it called a rice chart. Um, so we want to know the initial concentration. We'll then figure out how the concentration of those substances are going to change as this uh, reaction progresses towards equilibrium. And finally, what are the concentrations of H2I2 and HI at equilibrium? I'm going to give you some information. And if you read the problem, I told you the initial concentrations of H2 and I2. So let's go ahead and fill that into the initial column, or the initial row, excuse me. I have 0.2 molar concentrations of hydrogen and iodine, and I have no HI when the reaction starts. Over the course of the reaction, it's pretty safe to assume that you're going to use up hydrogen and iodine, and you're going to produce hydrogen iodide. So I should see a decrease in the concentration of my reactants and an increase in the concentration of my products. I would represent that by using an X. As the reaction progresses, I'm going to lose some amount of hydrogen gas. So negative x. I'm also going to lose some amount of iodine. Again, negative x. I'm going to gain hydrogen iodide. That's what's getting produced. I want to look at the coefficients in front of each of the substances. So nothing in front of H2, so just a 1, keep a 1x. Nothing in front of I2, so it'll also be a 1x. I've got a coefficient of 2 in front of hydrogen iodide. Eee, it's messy. So that's going to be 2x. So again, the change in concentration um, is just telling us as the reaction moves towards equilibrium, what substances are going to experience a decrease in concentration, in this case, my reactants, and what substances are going to experience an increase in concentration, in this case, my products. In the equilibrium row, we just add the initial and change rows together. So I'd have 2.000 minus x. and 2x. All right. And now the ice box has kind of served its purpose. We know what the concentrations, well, we kind of know what the concentrations are going to be at equilibrium. We're going to plug into our KEQ expression. So KEQ is going to be equal to the concentration of the product over the concentration of the reactants. Um, the value of KEQ is provided in the question, 64 in this case. And I'm going to take 2x and square it, 0 0.200 minus x. I'm also going to square that. Now at first glance, it might look like the math is going to get really nasty in a hurry. And don't get me wrong, it absolutely can. You may need to use quadratic equations. Um, but this one resolves itself pretty nicely. I can take the square root of everything, all the terms. Square root of 64 is 8. 2x squared, square rooted, is just 2x. And 0 0.200 minus x, minus x squared, square rooted, is just 0 0.200 minus x. If I go through the math, let's say I'll get 1.6 uh, minus 8x equals 2x, and x is equal to 0 0.16 molar. It's a concentration. A rookie mistake is to celebrate too early and assume that you're finished because you have a number. You just know the value of x. We've got to go back to that bottom uh, row of the ice box and plug in. So we know that x is 0.16 molar. So 0.2 minus 0.16. Don't worry too much about sig figs. If you can sort out ice boxes, I'll cut you some slack on the sig figs. And that's it. So at equilibrium, I should have a concentration of 0.04 molar for hydrogen and iodine gases, and I should have a concentration of 0.32 molar for hydrogen iodide. Um, it's okay to be confused. We will definitely work on this more in class. Uh, thank you for tuning in, and I hope you found this lesson helpful.